Uh, Harley Race. Harley Race. Uh, just fabulous. Uh, I was so deathly afraid the first match I had had with, had with him. And I had, was in WWE. It came in there. And, and he was the greatest guy in the world to be in the ring with. And to see him at WrestleMania three get a good match out of the Junkyard Dog, Harley Race really is the king. <laughs> if you can get a match out of the dog, you're doing good. <laughs> favorite favorite wrestler, just pure wrestling. You know when he said Harley Race. When the question was asked, Harley Race was, you know, was for me because uh, as a, as a, in 1979 I was wrestling in the Carolinas, Mid-Atlantic Wrestling. Um, in 1979 I was the U.S. champion in, in that territory. And Harley Race came as the world champion and um, it was my first one hour match. You know, wrestled to a draw and you were in the ring with the world champion. And, uh, you know, for the last five minutes of the match, of a one-hour match, is when you kick it, kick it into gear, you know, and you got to have enough gas left in your tank to, and, that, and I'll tell you, you know, Harley Race, like, like you said, God, he made me look like, he made me look like the new world champion in the last five minutes of the match, you know. It was all Ricky Steamboat. And uh, I'll never forget this. Um, Jordan Arena um, in Raleigh, uh, separate dressing rooms, and, and no, we would never had a chance to talk about the match. <laughs> it just didn't happen. But Harley Race is over here on this side of the building sitting in the locker room, and the locker room is down in the basement of this arena. And I'm on the other side of the Coliseum in Babyface locker rooms, sitting in the basement. And you can see the stairs going up, which would then lead you out to the arena. And it's at the, uh, we're the last match, we did just finished my first one hour match, and I'm sitting there and I'm sweating to beat the band, and, uh, and the door opens up and a referee by the name of Tommy Young, anybody who ring any bells that referee name of Tommy Young, like one of the greatest referees, and in, in, in I consider in the history of the business, and um, I look up because I hear the door open at the top of the stairs, Tommy Young pokes his head in, who was the referee, and he goes, Ricky, I go, yeah, Tommy, he goes, Chance said you did good, kid. <laughs> a year later, to the month, Dorton Arena, Raleigh, I got Harley Race again. <clears throat> Another one hour match. Tommy Young at the top of the stairs opens the door. Exact words. Chance said you did good, kid. You know, it's just like deja vu all over again. You know? <laughs> You know, that was the days that you'd go out there and be able to tell a story and put in some time. I don't know how much of this generation understands what I just said because what you see now is a lot of is short matches. I look at these guys out there in the ring and they're trying to put a 20 minute match into a 10 minute match. They're just doing so much. It's hard for me to understand a story that they're trying to tell. And um, I just hope that this this generation as we move forward to the new guys that you've seen come up from uh, NXT such as the Seth Rollins and the Roman Reigns and the Brett Wyatt's and all those names I had a hand in help train all those guys and they're all good but I, I whenever I do work with some young kids and train them I always try to teach them that the important thing in a match is how do you tell your story you know, and um, instead of just going out there for the sake of doing stuff. Uh, I watch a lot of the younger kids that um, that are trying to show me that they can do a match and they just go out there and do stuff just for the sake of doing stuff. And none of the stuff that they are doing has any relation, you know. They'll go to the arm, they go to the leg, they go to the back, they go to the head and neck, and then they go to the arm, they go, you know, like that, and there's no story there. <coughs> When I would wrestle Honky, or if he was wrestling me, you know, Ricky Steamboat with his arm drag, right? If you, a lot of you know me, know me for my arm drag. Well, my my thing is that my story is, is is the arm drag, and I'm trying to get back to his arm. Anytime that he breaks away from me, I'm trying to get back to that arm. 
And so the story that I'm trying to tell is that if a body part that I pick out, and it's the arm, which a lot of times it is, um, throughout the course of the match, if he's beaten up on me, but there are times which I am going to figure out how to get back to that arm. Because everybody knows, earlier in the match, if I did a good number on that arm, and then in the rest of the match that I try to get back to it, it clicks. Fans say, oh, uh, yeah, that's right, he, he spent the first 10 minutes working on that arm. So these 20 other minutes, I'm trying to get back to it. You know, and that's the story. I'm trying to get back to it. I see a lot of the guys today, they're, they, they, they jump on another body part. Oh, I said, why don't you, I mean, you started out great working on the arm, and all of a sudden you switched to the leg. And then after a few minutes with the leg, you switched to the lower back. And then you started taking them over in headlocks and switching to the head and neck. And they said, well, Ricky, the leg just happened to be there. And the headlock just happened to be there. So I was schooled to where if it was the arm, I'm going to figure a way to get to the arm, even if his leg's there. But I will get to that arm. And um, it's, just, it's a lost art in a sense, but I, I hope, you know, I hope we just don't lose it. Because it, it, the greatest workers in the world are the ones that have been able to tell the greatest stories. And uh, I think one of the last time breeds that we have right now is the last match you know, with Undertaker. And what a story he could tell. Triple H, what a story he can tell, you know. So, um, but they have to understand it's all about that, and that's what keeps the fans you know, sitting on the edge of the seat in the course of a match. That uh, they're able to tell a story instead of just, you know, I'm not knocking Lucha Libra or, <laughs> in a way I am, but, you know, there's uh, extreme stuff where they're just all over the place, nonstop, you know. And, and also in a show, I see a lot of times that the first match are all over the place and the second match are all over the place, the third <laughs> match are all over the place, you know. You could basically keep the same two guys that started the show and just repeat the second, third, fourth, fifth, you know, and the matches all the way up to the main event. And then a lot of times I'll have these guys in the main event that come back to me and say, guys, you know, we didn't get a reaction. I said, well, guess what? In the first five, six matches of tonight, they've seen the same thing. You guys are just all over the place. You know, I remember, I remember that when I started, and you, maybe Wayne, you can remember this too, the first match going out, Right? First match going out, promoter would come and say, keep it in the ring. That means not on the floor. And guess what? I want you two guys to go out there and you're not allowed to throw a single kick or punch. Now with those type of restrictions, guess what? Those two guys are pros enough to go out there and tell a story and have a good opening match. And from there, you go to the second match, and third, fourth, you have your intermission, then you come with your main events, and you build your show that way. So by the time you get to the very last match, hopefully it's your world champion, you know. Instead of these guys are in the first match, they're all outside, spilling out all over the place, and by the time you get up here, everybody's done everything, you don't leave anything for the main event. See what I'm saying? And, and that's done out of respect. Very important point in our business. That's just done out of respect. Because your main event guys are the ones that really sold the tickets. They're the advertised main event. And they're the ones that put the asses in the seats. And so out of respect, you, you curtail your build your show that way. You know? And main event guys, if they go out there and they do their job right, well hopefully when we come back to that town the next time around, we put more asses in the seats. <laughs> Like it. It was off. I, I, this is very important what he said about the, the, the er, er, first match, the second match. I can remember as a young kid starting out, and I, I would have to go out and do the, just what he said, the promoters. No hair pulling, no kicking, no punching, nothing. In fact, take the guy down and you guys stay on the mat and mat wrestle for 10 minutes, 15 minutes. And the next match, and I would stand at the curtain and I would watch then after. I'd watch the guys that were 40, 50 years old in the main event. I said, gosh, 
I'll be glad when I get 40 or 50 years old and I can go out and have the kind of match they're having, standing around and pushing each other and the people are going crazy because it was the main event and it was had been programmed for those guys to be in that main event. And I want, I, I said, man, if I can just, I can hope I can stay in this business for 20 years so I can be in the main event. And that's what we work towards, is to work to be in that main event, to be at that level, as opposed to, I'm serious, no kick. And if I was a promoter, and I told the guys in the first match, no kicking, no punching, no eye gouging, keep it in the ring, do not grab the microphone and throw it down on the ground and break it. We're not WWE with Stone Cold can throw 50 of them. We don't have that kind of money. Plus, the only dog man has to sing his song at the end of the night. Don't tear the microphone up. <laughs> but, but that's what we 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 always wanted to to work toward what the good guys, what the best guys were doing, and and it's important. And and there again, we're not a video game. I think the matches now are like video games for kids. <laughs> I know we're, a lot of times we sell our product to kids and for children, but it's the grown-ups who have the money that buy the tickets for the kids. So we shouldn't be trying to make our matches so it's like a video game. And that's what they do. And he, he's right. I, Steve's the promoter over there with Preston City Wrestling. Steve, you might as well just use two guys all the time. Dave worked the first match, come back, do the second, third, fourth. Just two guys. Let them bounce around out there. It's hard for me to watch it. Some kid asked last night, he said, did you watch Did you watch my match? I said, no, I don't watch matches. I just can't watch them anymore because it's not what I do. I, it's a whole different show than what I, 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 I don't do that. I don't do all these flips and this lucha stuff. That, but I'm going to be working for them in a couple of weeks. I better not say that. <laughs> I'm just making a cameo. I'm not going to. I don't do that nonsense. But yes, I mean, as a young kid, you 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 aspire to be the the main event. You aspire to be in that in that number four batter spot to to hit the home runs and and to score and get all the the guys off base. And and the, the guy that's the leadoff hitter, he understands in baseball that he's supposed to be the leadoff hitter. Like I said about the Rock, know your role. When the Rock said that, Ricky, and you know what, he was talking to the locker room. He wasn't talking to the fans. He was telling the guys in the back that was listening, know your position. It means know where you are on the card, do your job, and let the guys that's been billed as the main event, let them be the main event. As I grew on in the business, the best part of the whole thing was watching sometimes the main event be a failure. And you could sit back and go, see, they should have used me in that match instead of those two guys. <laughs> There's nothing better than to watch someone, you know, like, like, but like Ricky said, you want the main event to do good because you want a lot of people the next week and the next week. And if everyone's working good on the card, you're going to move up the card anyway. You might get used in that position, whether it be a six-man tag or something else, or you're in tag team matches that support the main event. Uh, and so uh, that's then it's it's a job. It's a job, and, and you don't start out on top. If you, I always tell a guy, look. If you want to destroy the building, you want to destroy the product, you want to break the tables and chairs, bring your own. If you want to do all these things, start your own promotion. Be your own promoter then. Make yourself the champion and have 50 belts around your waist. But don't go out and destroy this man's business and don't destroy it for you fans. The wrestlers can kill the business as fast as anything. All right, there you have it. So, the summary is know your role. Yeah, and shut your mouth. <laughs> know your position. Well, know your position, but and shut your mouth too. Also, I know you said you're not video games, but I, you, I never, you guys are pretty awesome. I've never, play, I never games. played a video game. I don't. I don't the, the only one I ever played was this thing where it was on black and white TV, and it did. Um, yeah. <laughs> and then this thing came out called Pac-Man. No, 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 he's not East Indian. Or <laughs> <laughs> America, everyone. America. <laughs>
Donald Trump, 2016. Monkey talk, man.
tow truck, 18-wheeler tow truck that is towing the cab of an 18-wheeler, okay? And he's towing it with the back end up so it's going backwards. Full-size 18-wheeler. Okay, you understand? Yes. Okay. So, J.O. Blood is sleeping on the passenger side. He's got his head against, head against the window like this. So, I creep up on this truck and I'm probably about 10 feet from it. And I hit my high beams. So if you're looking through the windshield, the only thing you can see is the whole front <laughs> of the truck, right? So he's sleeping like this. And both of us had the long black hair, so I reach over with my window and I start creeping the window down. So I just, just creeping a little bit, a little bit, a little bit. And his long black hair, the next thing you know, some of it's going out the window. Going out the window. So and I took the window up. <laughs> and now he's got about 10 inches of hair blowing out the window. And he's just sitting there sleeping. So I said, all right, I'm going to teach you some bitch to sleep on me. So I look over at him. And I'm about 10 feet from the front of this truck. With my high beam's on. And I go, no, no! And he opens his eyes, and he sees the front of a truck with like a head on. And he pulls the hair out of the head. <laughs> <laughs> you know, for a few seconds, his life was flashing the floor, right? You know, just... And then hair is... <laughs> That was a true rib. <laughs> American vulgarity and all. <laughs> Alright, next one. Little guy, little guy left there. Yeah, you. Yeah, you. Uh, I like this question. I, li I like this. I'll, get, I'll, I'll answer it for him. And I like asking this question, too. It's, it's called uh, your moment. So in your wrestling career, at what point, whether it was in ring, right before you're going out, or you had a conversation, whatever, where you knew that this was your moment, and you knew that your wrestling career was going to be your thing, was there any point where you just it just clicked for you, and you realized that? Ah, uh, no, not where that. I mean, winning your I, first title, anything like that. I. I not, I had like a five-year plan because I was a, a high school coach and teacher and I got into wrestling business because some of my friends were wanted to go and do that and, and, and we did it. And my cousin, Jerry the King Lawler, he was in the wrestling business doing quite well. I wasn't really attracted to any of it that way. But I had just a five-year plan to do this and then continue on and do something else. But... Uh, Probably after that Tupelo concession stand match we had where things just went really, really big for us in Memphis at that point in time, changed uh, the way I looked at the business. And it took, it, it actually took us from not making any money at all there, and I was starving to death, to, to actually to make a little bit of money. And then uh, uh, with that particular match, it, it set our careers in a, in a good path to go on and do other things. And it created uh, hardcore wrestling. There was a young kid in the locker room watching his dad wrestle. The young kid's name was Eddie Gilbert. And he went on to team up with a guy named Paul Heyman and they created this thing called ECW. And it took off of the Tupelo concession stand. Captain of the moment? Yeah. Your moment. My moment. I, I'm gonna, I keep going back to WrestleMania 3, but here's the story, you know, Randy and I, we knew we were going to work with each other, and, and we get, I give credit where credit is due, you know, the, the, the majority of the ticket sales and also the pay-per-view buy rate was because Hogan was hooked up with Andre the Giant, I mean, that was the main event, Randy and I were right under it, but you know, Andre and I were good friends, and, and uh, out of respect, I just was wondering if he was going to be doing anything special, but he, he couldn't. He had told me that his back was bad. He told me that his hips were bad. You know, his knees, uh, from, you know, carrying 540 pounds throughout most of his career. And it was, you know, he's going to just try and just work, you know, the bear hug. 
Well, you know, it's, it's kind of uneventful with two guys hugging each other. <laughs> you know, we started hearing the number, Randy and I started hearing numbers rolling in, you know, how many people were going to be at the Silver Dome, you know, 40, 50,000, 60,000, 70,000, 80,000 tickets sold. Uh, we heard that the pay-per-view buy rate was going real well with the number of homes that were buying into it. And so this was an opportunity 